Hello, welcome to a new episode of our MBSD podcast. The interoperability of engineering tools is, well, it's really a hot topic. Now we want to break up the data silos um, where the data of the tools is often hidden. And there's hardly any engineering project that does not have this as a challenge. A good reason for us to look at the data integration standard OSLC. And our guest, Axel Reichwein, is CEO of Connexus, a company that is all about linking data. So Axel, welcome and please introduce yourself. Hello, Tim. Thank you very much for the invitation. So my name is Axel Reichwein. Uh, I'm originally an aerospace engineer. I studied at the University of Stuttgart. And towards the end of my studies, I was lucky to be able to work on more exotic topics, uh, exotic from the perspective of aerospace engineering. So I worked on um, neural, net, ne neural networks, reinforcement learning, and also then in 2005, I looked at the systems model language. Um, and at that time, no, I, you know, I, I think I was among the first to really um, discovered this and I was very passionate about this. I managed to convince my PhD advisor, Dr. Stefan Rudolph, that I should uh, work with it. And, uh, but SysML was still evolving. So I decided during my PhD thesis to work with the unified modeling language, which shares a lot of concepts with the systems modeling language. And then um, a professor at Georgia Tech, Dr. Chris Paridis, he invited me to do a postdoc at Georgia Tech where I could continue what I was doing, but with the systems only language. And I'll, I'll, I'll quickly say what I was doing during my PhD and my postdoc. Um, I was actually trying to find out what would be a good system architecture modeling language to describe dependencies between engineering models. So I was looking at the systems modeling language or the unified modeling language, not just to describe a system at an abstract level, but to capture all these dependencies that exist between the more detailed discipline specific models, such as between a, a simulation model and a 3D model and, um, or among different simulation models. And the idea was that in order to um, perform trade-off studies, uh, we would just need to reconfigure the system model and then that th these changes would ref be reflected automatically to the more uh, domain specific models. Um, and um, so I, I looked into that for quite a few years. Then in 2012, I stopped my postdoc and Roger Borkhardt, uh, who was working mm -hmm. at John Deere, gave me the opportunity as a, as a consultant to work on a project that required OSLC. And so I had to learn a bit what, what OSLC means, uh, what open services for lifecycle collaboration stands for. And, and since then I've been, you know, very passionate about it. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my brief history. Okay, <laughs> very interesting. Uh, yeah, Axel, also from my side, very warm welcome. Nice to have you here. Nice to see you after all these years. Uh, we met sometimes, but uh, yeah, in the last two years, yeah, we had contact uh, <laughs> in, in, in the word sense. Um, we will talk about that later on. And um, yeah, like Tim already said, we are talking about OSLC. We are talking about data integration and um, maybe one, one question ahead of all. Uh, so what is the main difference for you between data integration and data exchange? So what, what oh, makes OSLC special? Yes, that's a good question. So I often hear the keyword interoperability, mm -hmm. and then I think of data exchange between two different applications. So where one application exports data, and that is then imported by the other application. And this exchange of data is without information loss, ideally, and this is what I understand as interoperability between applications. And this has been performed for decades now. We've got all kinds of data exchange formats. Um, there are still ongoing efforts, of course, to improve them. But it's, there, there's a big difference, I think, between interoperability and connectivity. 
Um, so you, you mentioned data integration. So just like data interoperability, I link, I, I, I think of data exchange and, um, and you mentioned data integration, then I think of data connectivity. And mm -hmm. uh, it's really, I think right now, important to not just copy data around across applications. Yeah, yeah. I think but this is the main difference, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's, mm -hmm. Sometimes it is necessary, especially I think in mechanical engineering where you need really to know the center of gravity in multiple different simulation models. You need to copy the value to synchronize the value uh, across multiple models so that they can run and, and provide meaningful results. But many engineering artifacts just need to be logically connected to, to, to other artifacts, such as a requirement. It's, it's not useful to copy a requirement around across different applications. Ideally, you define it in one application, and then you want to describe the context of this requirement and say, well, it has been tested by this test case. This test case was using this simulation model, which created this simulation result. That kind of connectivity across engineering artifacts, um, possibly across different product lifecycle phases, this is what I call data integration. And, and we have many data integration solutions, but we've got PLM, ALM, MBSC solutions, but they're not yet, I would say they offer some level of connectivity, but not yet this complete level of connectivity at the global level in a, in a tool agnostic way, which mm -hmm. OSLC mm -hmm. supports. Yeah. Okay, so OSLC is a data integration standard. Can you give us an overview of OSLC? So um, to be more specific, OSLC is a set of standards for an application programming interface. So uh, imagine all these different data sources, applications and databases in engineering. And in order to be able to create these cross domain links, so these links that cross the boundaries of applications or of domains, we, we cannot rely on the existing APIs. We need APIs that offer a bit more freedom to create these cross-domain links. And um, these interfaces to all these different data sources need to be standardized, standardized in order to support the linking of data. And this is, so yes, you can say OSLC is a data integration standard, uh, but you can also more simply view it as an, as an API standard which helps the creation of links. Um, and, um, and, and when you think of APIs, you often think that the API clients are programs and that these OSLT APIs are only useful possibly for, um, for developers writing some code against that OSLT API. But the OSLT APIs also expose dialogues meant to be consumed by humans so that we can easily um, embed search, bless you, uh, easily embed search dialogues in other applications. Mm -hmm. So an OSLT API is, is yeah, um, um, supports the linking, but not just at the code level, but also at the more user-friendly graphical level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it's uh, uh, specific to engineering, or is it? Could it be independent of engineering? So can I link an accounting system with a shop system, for example? Yes, indeed. So right now, OSLC is used primarily within engineering, but all the concepts are domain independent. They could be used in accounting, healthcare, finance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually, OSLC, if you look under the hood, you will see that it uses standards like RDF that web search engines like Google also use to support data inter interoperability. Um, so if you, for example, if you look at schema.org, so OSLC, if the set of standards that are used by OSLC are very much aligned with uh, the, the web standards and, mm -hmm. and what's going on in general on the web to, to support connectivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and when we are talking about a standard, uh, who is responsible for this thing? 
Yes, so the organization now managing this, the OSLC standard is called OASIS. And it, right now it's managed under an open project, meaning that anybody can actually for free join the meetings, contribute to the standards. The standards are available to the public, uh, no need to pay anything. So the standards are really meant to to be visible and, and, and to facilitate collaboration uh, among engineers to, to improve them. Yeah. How many people are involved in, in the meetings typically? And so, the standards development? Yes, oh, I would say maybe four or five. Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> to to, so to be honest, th th these meetings are very technical mm. and uh, um, it's, it's, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but uh, recently a new series of meetings was created led by Iran Gary of uh, IBM mm -hmm. to um, actually just talk about OSLC, OSLC at a higher level. And these are monthly meetings that are, I think, more interesting for persons who want to learn more about OSLC and, or, and also where OSLC is heading rather mm -hmm. than these very technical weekly meetings that are about the specifications and where, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's often quite boring. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we already learned you are dealing with OSLC for about 10 years. Um, is there, uh, yeah, how is the adoption rate? Are there tools uh, supporting OSLC already? Can you name some of them? Sure. So as for any new technology, you have uh, this, uh, you have different groups of persons who adopt it. You have the innovators. These are the first ones who adopt it. Then you have the early adopters, uh, early majority, late majority, and lagger. I would say that because IBM has a suite of tools that support OSLC, and these tools are quite well adopted already, uh, and, and with these tools, you can see OSLC in action. You can see the linking across tools. And so I would mm -hmm. say that an early majority of engineers are actually seeing OSLC. Um, now, there, I would say among these organizations, some are seeing the potential to use OSLC to extend the IBM ecosystem to non-IBM applications using OSLC. Um, and so I would call them early adopters um, and, and where OSLC is still used in combination tightly with the IBM applications. Um, you also have uh, obviously other vendors supporting OSLC, but very often it's for an integration with IBM. That, that's often, it's, mm -hmm. it's not always the case. Some also use it to, to link within their own tool suite. I think PTC is an example. Um, and I would say that you have innovators, a much smaller group, who is looking at OSLC really to achieve connectivity completely independent of IBM, to really look at the pure OSLC and, and what is uh, what can be built with OSLC. Um, and I, yeah, I, I actually think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of what is possible with, with, with OSLC to now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are talking a lot about it uh, for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very interesting how long it takes to, yeah, to really integrate uh, tools with OSLC. And I think one thing is that many tools just, uh, yeah, integrate the consumer part. Uh, so they want yes, to, to gather in information, but they don't want to expose information. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. That, that is confusing and misleading because many vendors will say on their web page, we support OSLC, but actually they're, they're just consuming the data from an OSLC API uh, oh. and not actually really supporting OSLC by exposing their data as OSLC resources that can be linked then with, with other engineering artifacts. That, yeah. That's indeed um, quite annoying. Yes. Yes. Is there any certification for, for tools so that I need a certificate to announce that I'm also C conform or is there a validation suite or something like that available? So uh, 
I think it's necessary to ask um, some persons in the OSLC community to, to give you to be 100% certain. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of such a validation suite, but I, I think informally one has been certainly developed, and, and there is one that is open source. Um, but now, you know, you, you have within OSLC so many different specifications so that some of them are domain specific, some are domain independent. Um, that's also maybe why OSLC is considered a bit complicated because it covers many aspects. Mm -hmm. And um, so many uh, tools that claim to support OSLC will only uh, support certain aspects of OSLC. Um, and uh, that, yeah, yeah. Is it an issue in, in practice that, that, for example, a tool announces that it is OSLC conform, but uh, well, it's not 100% conform to the standard, and so it, it does not work? So, like uh, interoperability between system L tools, <laughs> there's a yeah, yeah, yeah. data exchange format XMI, but well, it does not work very well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as Christian mentioned, the, the problem is that the vendors don't specify how they support OSLC. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, you think, oh, it's great, they support OSLC, but then they, they just consume the OSLC, uh, uh, another OSLC API. They don't expose themselves an OSLC API, which is, uh, to be honest, something that maybe goes against the business incentive of a software vendor, because you're opening up your data to, to the users and so you're, uh, you know, you, you're possibly losing vendor lock-in. So that, that's mm -hmm. one risk, um, which, you know, some vendors could also say that there are many opportunities with OSLC, so it makes sense to, to fully adopt it uh, and, and, and offer new applications that can only be built on top of these OSLC APIs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um... In, in respect to time, we can't go into every detail of OSLC, <laughs> but I guess there are two or three things we, we should have a look into. And Axel already mentioned some of them. So he often talked about an OSLC specification. Uh, just to drop another name, uh, OSLC specifications are around a vocabulary, and this could be domain specific or not domain dependent. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, the vocabulary is uh, the real important thing to standardize things so that every tool talks about the same thing. Even it, it calls it internally different to the outside over the OSLC API, it's called this and that, and it's totally yeah. clear for that systems, what is meant. Exactly, so OSLC has standards to describe domain specific resources like requirements test cases so that's also to support interoperability to the exchange of these requirements with other applications uh, oslc has some uh, standards describing the domain independent aspects such as the versions of resources the change events of resources the access rules now somehow oslc must define, okay, what are the concepts that we're using to define the versions or these domain-specific um, entities? And OSLC has looked at the web. What does the web do? And the, an example, actually a great example of data interoperability at web scale is schema.org. So this is where you have a bunch of concepts that have been defined. So this is a movie, this is a recipe, etc. But all these concepts need to be identified in a unique way. And with schema.org, they, they are identified using a URL, an HTTP URL. The advantage of identifying these concepts that you want to standardize using HTTP URLs is that, on the one hand, you can test if these are unique identifiers. And at the same time, you can use these identifiers to access these concepts. So, uh, I can do an HTTP GET and, and uh, access the description of this concept. Um, 
So you, I really recommend everybody to look at schema.org. Mm -hmm. And um, I really think that it shows, I think, how uh, standards should be defined, not just for movies, recipes, and not just for NDSC, but actually across all engineering. Um, it's, it's, um, I think it makes sense to be aligned with data inter interoperability practices that are already, already so widely adopted. And, and, and um, you need to keep in mind that over half of the web pages contain URLs that point to these standardized concepts uh, uh, defined in schema.org. So, okay, so basically what I'm trying to say is OSLC adopts for the different definition of these vocabularies, the same approach as schema.org. Uh, and mm -hmm. and schema.org is supported by the search engines like Google, Bing, Yahoo, and, and supported by all the web content creators. And uh, it's, it's a huge number because over half of the web page web pages um, have, have links to schema.org. Mm -hmm. And, and how and are the, to make the it... oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, how are the concepts then defined? When I ask such a service to give me the, the specification of a movie. So uh, what do I yeah. get? Do I get some some text that explains what a movie is? Uh, or is it more formal? So yeah, it needs to be machine readable so that the search yeah. engines um, understand that uh, like a movie database like IMDB contains mm -hmm. plenty of movies and their ratings. Now, when we look at this movie page of IMDb, we, we see the rating, mm -hmm. but the search engine like Google will need to understand that what we're looking at, seven out of 10, is actually a movie rating. And so there's the HTML content of the page. And in, in addition, either embedded in the HTML or uh, next to it, you will find some RDF. RDF mm -hmm. is some machine readable data, machine readable data saying that actually we have a resource of type movie rating. Uh, it has a rating value of seven, the maximum value is 10. Mm -hmm. And Google or another search engine will understand this. And then if you do a search for, for that particular movie, it will show you the movie ratings from multiple movie databases right mm -hmm. away. Uh, mm -hmm. because it has already collected that information and understood that information. Um, so in, um, th there, there's really nothing special, you know, in, in defining standardized concepts. It's just that they need to have unique identifiers. And in our world, the most practical, I would say most suitable unique identifiers are HTTP URLs. Otherwise, we end up with a requirement defined in SysML, a requirement defined in RecIF, a requirement defined in, uh, you know, mm -hmm. step by the step community, and and we need to easily distinguish them and easily access them also. Uh, so if if everybody was using REF, for example, for standardization purposes, we would be able much more easily to see the differences or or the the things that mm -hmm. are, are in common between all these different engineering standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there we are. Um, yeah, quite near the topic we had with Fabian Neuhaus, where we talked about ontologies and distributed ontologies, mm -hmm. and uh, this is also a very interesting point. But bringing it back to um, to the engineering domain, so if you are looking to the requirements management specification, you see uh, it is specified like. Um, a requirement has exactly one ID. It has exactly one name. It might have a change date. Or I made this thing up, um, but but it tells you, yeah, how you describe a requirement and what you must provide if you are uh, compliant to this specification and what might be and uh, yeah uh, might be there in, in data. And uh, another interesting thing I've find in OSLC is that you have this 80-20 approach. So uh, these groups defining those specifications are trying to define the most common 80% uh, of those resources of a requirement, for example. And uh, yeah, tool vendors or users are able to extend those uh, specifications, right? Exactly. And I, and I think 
any standardization efforts in general would uh, will adopt the same approach. I'm sure within the CCML standardization committee, you're also trying to cover 80% of the most important topics. And then mm -hmm. with stereotypes, you can always you know, support extensions. So I don't think this is unique to OSLC. Um, the, the extension mechanism with RDF is very simple because by definition, RDF supports this open world assumption. Um, and, and actually, we need to constrain it. We, we, we don't want to have chaos and, and any kind of, um, uh, uh, we don't want to see a requirement be defined in 10, 10 million different ways. We, we do want to constrain how a requirement is defined. And so uh, we, within OSLC, we use shackle or resource shapes to provide constraints to say, yeah, a requirement must have, for example, an, an identifier. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So um, just to say that the, these, what we're talking about there is, is, I would say, not unique to OSLC. It's, it's common to any standardization method. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned SysML several times, and you also mentioned several people who are heavily involved in the SysML standardization, like um, Roger Burkhardt, who's one of the co-developer of SysML, or Aaron Gary, uh, who's involved in UML and SysML development, and also in the current SysML v2 development. So um, there seems to be a relationship between OSLC and SysML. <laughs> so how yes. they are related? Absolutely. So you maybe remember this picture of SysML where you see a cube and you see that SysML connects requirements to structure and behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so SysML is about connecting information as well. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just that um, you're connecting information at a very high level of abstraction. And if it's the only thing you want to do, you're good with SysML. I would say that so, mm -hmm. so you're, you're connecting the information horizontally, right? You know, from requirements to structure and behavior, but at, at, a, at, a, at an abstract level. Yeah, the horizontal silo. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> horizontal, exactly. We're connecting horizontally. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say that it's useful to connect also vertically mm -hmm. from abstract to specific, uh, yeah. because at some point you need the real simulation models, the real simulation results, that will tell you if your system architecture is even feasible or if, it, if it's um, uh, in sync with, with what's going on at, at a detailed level. And, and that's where OSLC then becomes useful for these vertical connections. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's one aspect. Um, also, um, it's in like, how should I say this? Um, we have, even at a higher level of attraction, we might be using different tools. Engineers might be using a tool just for requirements, another mm -hmm. just for test cases. Yeah. Um, so they, they might not always be using uh, SysML. Mm -hmm. So OSLC is also useful for, for systems engineers who want to connect the data uh, at, at that abstract level horizontally across different tools. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would say that the, the I mean, the, the fundamental um, uh, difference that OSLC enables is that before OSLC, these links had to be created within a specific application, these cross domain links. I either use mm -hmm. a PLM solution or an ALM solution or an MBSC, MBSC solution to create these cross domain links to say that my requirement is linked to a blog or a test case, etc. You, you're dependent on one specific application to do this. And with OSLC, the, the, the creation of links can now happen in a distributed way. Engineers can stay within their domain-specific applications to create these links. They don't have to switch to another application, like a PLM, ALM, or MBSC solution to create these links. Um, and that reduces the barrier to creating the links. And so, um, and I honestly think it, it, all this is inspired by the web. Um, if, if, for example, you could only add content to the web through one single ap application, there would be a bottleneck. 
and, and mm -hmm. we use all kinds of tools to, to create content for the web right now in a distributed way. And that's why the web can scale. So, um, and, and so these cross domain links in the past, we've just, we've used them as, oh, it's just another piece of data within an application. But I think we need to elevate the concept of these cross domain links um, and, and view them as first class citizens. We have the domain specific data and at the same level of importance, we need to manage these cross domain links. And ideally we need to manage them in a way that is independent of a specific application. That's the only way we can manage them in a scalable way in, in the long term. <clears throat> I, I'm sorry that my answer went a bit, was a bit longer, but uh, mm -hmm. these were ideas that were yeah, in my mind that I wanted to, 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 it, it, to ask. It brings to a point what what's the idea behind the new system LV2 API. And uh, I think it's no coincidence that uh, there were people who said, okay, we also want a platform specific binding for OSLC for this uh, system LV2 API, just to, uh, yeah, to realize exactly that what what you Excel what you described right now. Exactly. Keep in mind that this idea of using platform independence and platform specific bindings, um, it it might actually create by design a lack of interoperability. So I remember for UML and SysML, you had this nice separation of platform independent platform specific. Then you could define stereotypes in XMI in many different ways. And we, mm -hmm. we, we didn't have interoperability between system L tools. So every time I hear, oh, we have something platform independent, something platform specific, I, I, I see the potential for a gap between the platform independent and platform specific and, and the possibility for many different platform specific implementations that end up not being compatible. Mm -hmm. So I, I really hope we learn the lesson from system LV1 when it comes to the system LV2 API and, and that we can actually be very specific when it comes to the API. And it's only by being specific that we avoid any misinterpretations and, 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 and you know, uh, problems with interoperability. <laughs> it brings to my mind just right now <laughs> that if you're digging very deep on the OMG servers, you will find a SysML v1.3 OSLC binding from Excel, I guess. I remember finding something like that from from you it's really? years so, ago <laughs> so, uh, i don't know i it, it doesn't ring a bell i, 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 I will it, look it up i will look it up <laughs> <laughs> okay 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 yeah. i just know that three? i work with xmi and and all the different vari variations of xmi and it was a pain and i i really hope that uh this, this these problems can, can Insane mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I remember there's there's uh, this some uh, OSLC stuff somewhere. Yeah, so I there was a, a, <laughs> maybe you're thinking of the OSLC for MBSC Working Group. It was yeah, maybe. in 2013, 14, I think. 14, 15, yeah, yeah, 14, yeah, 15, yeah 2013 yes, it was exactly. initiated. Yeah, I have yeah. the website right open now. Yeah. And so. <laughs> That's where we converted the SysML standard, which is defined, um, uh, you know, through, well, in XMI, and the whole meta model is defined in XMI, and we converted that into an equivalent RDF vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 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 very easy to take existing standards and make them web compatible, if if you want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and um, unfortunately, you know, the, the I don't think that there was enough traction then to, to continue these efforts. Uh, uh, maybe you were a little bit ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so coming back to the topic, um, <laughs> maybe more interesting for our listeners instead of OMG arch archaeology, archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> what's the, the English word for is um, maybe it sounded interesting for, for somebody and he would like to play around with OSLC. So, so what's a good place to start? Oh my God. Good luck. Um, it's not <laughs> <easy>. <laughs> I'll say from the start. So obviously you should check out some videos, some articles, some primer articles. 
then you should look at some open source solutions. Uh, there is a Slack workspace uh, where you mm -hmm. can ask questions. Mm -hmm. There's also a forum, okay, where you can ask questions. Um, I think that many users who actually have questions about, who, who need to use these OSLT APIs are actually using the OSLT APIs of IBM. And, and they, they use the JAS forum for these questions. Mm -hmm. So um, when it's purely about OSLT, yeah, that's, then it's, it's useful to use the, the Slack workspace of OSLT or, or the forum. Um, and are there any open source tools using OSLT? So two different kind of engineering tools like a requirement tool and then systems modeling tool or simulation tool or so? So there are quite a few implementations, yes, mm -hmm. of, that are open source. Um, and so I would look at Eclipse Neo as, as the, and, mm -hmm. and at GitHub. There's an OSLC project on GitHub and there's Eclipse Neo. Now keep in mind that any OSLC API for a specific tool, it needs to be maintained in order to, to stay up to date because mm -hmm. the tools have a, a native interface that changes over time. And mm -hmm. um, e even the whole, the many libraries that OSLC APIs use evolve over time. So um, you, you will find quite a few open source solutions that are just completely outdated that you cannot even compile, okay? Mm. It's, it's just because um, nobody is maintaining them right now. So, mm -hmm. um, but you can still, I think, see examples of how to implement these OSLT APIs in Java. And with a few questions, you can certainly update them and, and, and run them uh, on your machine. Uh, there's also, if you prefer Python to Java, there's the PyOSLC uh, project, mm -hmm. which I think um, is, it, it takes a different take on OSLT because it assumes that um, you don't want to modify anything of, your, of the application onto which you want to add this OSLT wrapper. And so it explains how you can uh, do this OSLT extension in a more seamless way. Um, and I think that's the right approach in the long term also. Um, mm -hmm. And what else? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I hope I answered your question. You won't find perfect good documentation. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So okay. you really need to be a bit more proactive, ask questions. If you're stuck, you will probably get me stuck. And um, there's just right now not enough persons in the OSLT community to, to create that high quality uh, level documentation that, that helps people get into the topic uh, easier, yeah, mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but this was exactly uh, one thing why my employer, Contact Software, we asked ourselves, why is there no Python implementation? Why is there no Python, Python SDK? And that's where we, when we went to Axel and uh, we are developing it uh, in, in, in common, uh, we are sponsoring all the work and we will, yeah, surely publish it uh, open source because we it think it is already we, open source it is already it is source. already yeah right yeah. correct and people older versions already, already. Issues and uh, yeah yeah so we're, we're seeing that people are testing so, it using it yeah python reminds me of jupyter lab so can i use uh, this uh, pi olc uh, with jupyter lab and can easily play around with it oh. i don't know um <laughs> the thing is that you an OSLC API is is not you know some algorithm to create plots where you know that, that's the more typical application to use Jupyter notebooks. Mm -hmm. um, so typically the, the API code is is written in a in an IDE, and you want to yeah you, you need a server you need to deploy it on your server there are quite a few things involved, so it's not your simple application that you know is mm -hmm. is, is runs autonomous or in isolation in, in a notebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I could imagine that um, taking Pi OSLC as a basis, it it should be able or someone should be able to write some kind of plugin for uh, for Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, to enable so, 
yeah, let's say a, a notebook to to import requirements or, or yes. something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in general, I think many organizations would like to be able to add a tag in the source code so that somebody reviewing that tag can actually click on the requirement that actually the source code tries to satisfy. So there is, an, whether it's Java code or Python code, um, that connectivity between source code at a very detailed level, at a, at a specific line of code with a requirement is, is something that I think is, is very useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, maybe if, if people are uh, still interested in OSLC with all its, <laughs> its complications, um, I heard you are uh, also organizing a conference about OSLC each year, I guess. Uh, can you yes. tell us about it? So we had three editions of the OSLC Fest. Uh, the first one in mm -hmm. 2018, the second one in 2020, and then the last one um, last year, at the end of last year. And I think it's the gr a great way to see who is doing what with OSLC. You will see many mm -hmm. demonstrations of vendors. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing over the years more vendors doing stuff with OSLC, discovering OSLC, and gradually supporting more aspects of OSLC. So um, if, if you want to get an idea, yeah, to tip your toe into this OSLC world, I really recommend checking out the, the, the OSLC Fest videos that are available mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. either on YouTube. I think they're all on YouTube, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can link them uh, under the video. And will there be a conference th this year? I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I need to check with my co-organizers uh, mm -hmm. that we I think so, probably in November of this year. Yeah. Okay. Um, as you can see, we're not perfectly organized. <laughs> we're not like the OMG where we know exactly what we're doing. But, um, uh, you know, people are welcome to to help, obviously, with the organization of that uh, event. Um, and uh, we, we, re we, when we um, released the call for, for presentations, we received many uh, submissions and we even had to reject some. Which we can then mm -hmm. accept probably for the next uh, event. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very optimistic there will be one this year. And we encourage the early adopters that are doing something with OSLC to come out of their bubble and share it with the world because there are many companies, I think, who are doing stuff with OSLC but not yet publicly sharing it out of maybe fear that it's not yet uh, mm -hmm. mature enough. But mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's interesting for other engineers to see the, the thought process of why an organization is uh, starting to adopt OSLC, how they're they're doing it. And mm -hmm. and and you know, the OSLC Fest is intended to create connections among among persons interested in OSLC and, and, and that we can benefit from each other, from the experiences of each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, is it always at the same location or in the world? Is it in it, it, it Europe or in the US? Or? The first time it was a normal in person conference in Sweden mm -hmm. at, at KTH, and the next two editions were online. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and I have a feeling we will keep it online because I don't know, it, it did work quite well. So, mm -hmm. so. Okay. So yeah, maybe one final question uh, and outlook. So what are the future plans of OSLC? So uh, impossible for me to predict, of course, but mm -hmm. um, we will see more integrations with IBM ELM based on OSLC. Um, then I think that at some point we will also see the adoption of OSLC in the, in, within the engineering domain, but independently of IBM tools. Um, and I think the, in the middle or long term, we will see the adoption of OSLC in other industries, in the machine learning or healthcare industry. And but for this to happen, you know, the, the 
the documentation. I would also say the tools around OSLC need to become more accessible, more commercialized, more mature. And um, so, you, you know, we're, we're, OSLC is still mainly used by innovators and, and, and early adopters. Mm -hmm. And I think we will slowly see, yeah, this um, a growing maturity. And it's possible that if OSLC is do gets this re reaches this adoption outside of engineering, it might look also a bit different because um, some ideas of OSLC could be realized in a slightly different way, maybe without relying necessarily on RDF. Mm -hmm. Still using RDF to define the standardized concepts, but maybe not um, for each API resource. Um, and to give maybe an idea of what this could look like, so in order to manage distributed microservices, we have seen tools that have been released to manage these service mesh architectures. So these are tools to manage the service to service communication. Um, when you have a bunch of different APIs and you want to manage how they communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And inspired by what we're seeing to manage the communication between services, we, I can imagine very similar tools and a very similar architecture to manage the linking of, mm. of API resources. Um, and um, I don't know what it would, we, what it would be called. Um, I've noticed that the keyword data mesh is already taken and it's, <laughs> it, it describes principles at a, high, at a high level of abstraction. So it's not very clear how you, you implement these data mesh principles. Um, so, so it's, I don't know where the journey will lead to, but mm. I, I'm, I'm convinced that linking data will become more and more uh, prevalent. It's, it, you, it's the only way you can uh, understand the data. If you understand its context, if you can discover its context, and in a complicated world, that becomes uh, increasingly important. Right. Okay. Yeah, so thank you, Axel, for your time. So if anybody is interested to integrate his tools with OSLC or whatever, just contact <laughs> Axel. It's, it's his everyday job to, to create OSLC uh, integrations. Um, yeah, it was very interesting, longer than I expected. Um, and we, we skipped many, many of uh, yeah, interesting many topics more. on it. <laughs> yeah, we had many more. <laughs> okay, but Tim, what's next on the agenda? Wow, yeah. So the next topic or you know, the next date is uh, finally set, but uh, will be probably something about Sysmail v2. This is on the final run. Uh, last week at the OMG meeting in Washington, we decided uh, that we will submit SysMLB2 definitely this year, end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and there's many interesting subtopics, uh, the, the language itself, you know, the features of the language, the API with OSLC um, would be another interesting topic, um, or uh, the transformation from SysMLB1 to SysMLB2, uh, which will also be part of the SysMLB2 standard. So, um, yeah, we will select one of those topics, I guess, uh, and then we send a notice in our social media channels and so. Okay, great. Yeah. And well, the date is not finally set, but around about in a month, I guess, uh, or typical frequency, uh, one podcast per month. Yeah, and then, well, uh, do not forget. Trust us, we are systems engineers. Bye-bye. Goodbye.